My son-in-law, Cameron, and Kate have bought themselves a 2007 Nissan X-Trail. I've been helping them over the last year to turn it into a viable overland tourer, what I like to call the backpackers tourer. We started with a basic packing system that Cameron built and that's cost him under $250 for the whole thing. And we're now going to build an electrical system with a separate battery to run a fridge, solar input charging, and to charge camera batteries and things like that, all built in, but we're going to do it for the minimum amount of money, as simple as we can possibly make it, but something that will really work very well indeed. I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and remember to hit that notifications bell to make sure you catch our weekly videos. Some thoughts on a solar blanket. Uh, as opposed to fixing a solar panel onto the vehicle, the idea of a solar panel, of course, is to maintain a charge or refresh a charge that has been taken by the fridge when the vehicle is parked. You don't want the fridge to drain the start battery, so the start battery then cannot start the car. Then you've got a problem, and you fit what is known as a split charge system. And there are a couple of options. Some are very expensive, some are very cheap, some don't work well at all, and others are very effective and very inexpensive. I've brought a Cameron to Perth Pro, my favorite auto electric shop. <laughs> okay. And I'm gonna ask Heiner to help him build an electrical system. And the, the criteria, the aim is, we're not doing it cheap, but we're doing it budget. And there's a very, very big difference between the two. So basically we just want to go, we want to go camping for a couple of days and we want to have a battery system that keeps everything running, fridge, phones, chargers, things like that. Yeah, so you basically just have USB to charge things and a connector for a fridge. Yeah. That's bottom line. Yeah. All right. And you will have the battery inside the vehicle. Yeah. All right. So we can't use any cranking batteries. We can't use any batteries that will gas out when they're being charged very important because otherwise you build up hydrogen in the car and that might lead to a big bang so you need a fully sealed battery which ideally you use an AGM battery it's just state of the art so we got different options there that I can show you but I recommend a higher quality unit so this will be a good choice the Century deep cycle battery uh, I always recommend them for deep cycle installations uh, inside a vehicle under the bonnet I usually recommend the full rivers but for what you're trying to do this would be a good battery it's not gonna live as long because you haven't got a DC DC charger but you still get a decent lifespan out of it with your constant voltage alternator you should get two three years out of it easily also depending on how often and how far you're gonna cycle it. So I'm trying to find out if that vehicle has got a temperature compensating alternator or if it's got an old style constant voltage alternator. If it's a constant voltage alternator, the voltage will stay at 14, 14.2 14 volts somewhere there. That enables us to use a smart solenoid or even a manual switch or just a connector because it will, even though it doesn't charge the battery 100%, it will be good enough for a budget build. The battery is not going to live as long, but you can use it and you can save money on the DC DC charger if you go, if you're okay with having a reduced battery life and using the battery not to its full potential, but uh, only using about 70% of the battery's capacity. Then you can get away with that little trick. But we have to find out what alternator is in there and what its minimum voltage is. If it's old style alternator, we should have 14 volts on it. Which is very close and the engine's still warm, so the alternator would have reduced its charge voltage. So that means we can use a smart solenoid or even a direct connection to charge a battery up. Not in a perfect manner, but in a good enough budget way. Basically, this is what we're doing. We're running a cable, fuse it at the battery, run it to 
the auxiliary battery which is going to be located on the floor behind the driver's seat. We are going to have no switching apart from an Anderson plug that Cameron can then when arriving at a campsite and now wants to disconnect, isolate the start battery, unplugs it. We could put a solenoid, we could put a switch, but why the extra connections? The thing is that every time you have a connection, you have a voltage drop. And for this system to work even slightly efficiently, reducing voltage drop will, must be your number one goal. And this is going to be the simplest possible system that you can use that will actually work very well. If you can, you will want to make your connections look like that. These lugs look like this, all right, a crimping tool will look like this, all right, or you can use a hydraulic one, I've also got a hydraulic one that looks like this, and then the shrink wrap, shrink, heat shrink to seal it up. The heat shrink is particularly important in the connections in the engine bay because it gets wet in there and you want to stop water getting in here because you will get uh, corrosion and very quickly voltage drop due to corrosion so all of these uh, things that we're doing are aimed at reducing voltage drop all right we're back in the workshop the following morning our progress is quite good so what's very important is to fuse the cable that's running from the battery, start battery, to the auxiliary battery and you fuse it on both ends. I'm going to draw a circuit diagram. This is your start battery. We're going to call that S and that's got a positive terminal and a negative terminal on your battery. Here we're going to call this the auxiliary battery. Okay, that's the one in the back powering the fridge and the other bits and pieces and that also has a positive terminal on it and a negative terminal on it. You're going to run a cable here and you are going to put that inline fuse. I recommend probably 80 amps, depending obviously on how much current is going to be drawn by this battery as it is charged by this battery. So the vehicle engine charges this battery and as this battery fills up, it fills up this battery there. So you've got another 80 amp fuse there. This cable needs to be fused there and there to protect. So if there is a short circuit anywhere along this line here, remember to keep the fuses close to the battery as practical, okay? Therefore, if there is a short, the fuse, one of the two fuses will blow. So that's my fuse, small fuse box for this end of the battery. That's the connector there. And I'm going to put some of this on it to protect it. The rule is if you connect a battery and you connect something to that battery it must be fused at the battery. No questions, that's the deal. I've seen a lot of cars burnt out because of uh, pure poor fusing practices. That's an 80 amp fuse and we can put an 80 amp heavy fuse on it because we want to lower the voltage drop and that the cable is very thick. If we put a heavy fuse on a thin cable it's possible that if the cable shorts the cable may burn before the fuse blows. So matching the two very important if you want to um, protect your vehicle. Now we've got obviously a connector because we want to disconnect that battery when we're camped at night. So what Cameron has elected to do is to put an Anderson plug there that he can disconnect this battery and that battery at night. So this battery, where, as its current is being drawn from it, does not affect the start battery. The next challenge for us is to find a place to locate the battery. We've chosen an area behind the driver's seat on the floor. If you, if you don't, if you really don't mind, because you want to strap this down somehow so it doesn't come flying. So you can drill a hole through there, 
a hole through there. Whatever you do, do not take any shortcuts mounting the battery. It has to be absolutely secure. And in the event of an accident, it cannot come loose. We've chosen two 10 millimeter eye bolts through the floor. So that is the size cable that you want. Okay. So we just grab, what do you think? Five meters, six meters? Okay, so we got the big cable. The one thing you don't want to save on is a good connection from the front to the back. Okay. So that is six BNS cable, which is the overkill for what we are doing right now. But we want to overkill it to minimize voltage drop because we do not have a DC-DC charger. So every point one of a volt more at the battery counts big time in terms of battery charging. So we got proper crimp connectors. Uh, you want to make sure you use a good uh, crimping tool for it as well. And then we have a bolt in fuse with an ATM fuse here. We will use that to connect. That goes to the front yeah. on the battery and we will get another one for your battery box as such as a main fuse inside the battery box because you have to fuse either side because mm. the battery when the cable shorts out both sides can supply power to the short potential short circuit if there is one yep. you want to make sure you see where this hole is in the front here yep. the heat shrink should go up onto this point and cover this hole so no moisture can get in because otherwise it will accumulate there it can't get out and you get a lot of uh, corrosion in there and that will kill the connection over time okay this battery the negative goes to earth this battery, the negative goes to earth. We'll get to that in a minute. We are now going to run some kind of power outlet box. In the case of Cameron's vehicle, it's built into the battery box itself. So if we look at the uh, battery box we're building and this, basically the wiring is the positive comes in here Okay, that's this cable here, and the negative comes in here, that's this cable here, and you would go past a fuse, okay, and then to your power outlet, and likewise, power outlet. You would do exactly the same again. Fuse, power outlet, power outlet, and do the same again. Fuse, power outlet. Yeah, you get the picture. So that's basically the, as simple as you can get. And our split charging system consists of that. Disconnected at night. That's it. Nothing could be simpler. And when you get going in the morning, start the motor, plug it in, and off you go. And as this battery is charged, so will this battery be charged. So here it is. Uh, two Anderson plugs, and the purpose of two is that so one can be used for input charging from the uh, alternator battery, start battery, and the other one from solar. Solar, simple solar regulator. These are very inexpensive, very effective. You wire the solar blanket up to that and so you have input current and a simple simple voltage meter will give you an idea of how your battery is doing two line fuses one there and one there simple as that not expensive and effective output for a fridge usb charging for whatever here's a tip though to increase the life of a AGM battery in this kind of environment where it's connected directly to the vehicle battery, it will never ever get 100% charge, ever, because of the voltage drop. So to look after your battery, every month or so, just run an AC charger onto the battery and give it a full charge. You do that once a month, this is going to last three or four years of quite hard use that's the difference it will make because if you never charge it to a hundred percent during the life of the battery by two years the battery is very tired and almost time to replace it in the next video perhaps the most important and as it turns out one of the most challenging upgrades of all okay so we got plenty of clearance with that one tires 
Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss our weekly videos.